Nick's got three days of editing to do in the edits. <laughs> Should have time now. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll cut it as we go along. Hello, and welcome to the latest in a series of British Film Designers Guild webinars focusing on working in the art department. The Guild was formed over 70 years ago with the aim of raising the standards and profile of the art department and protecting the interests of its members. Those core principles still apply today, as we are a flourishing and evolving community of over 520 accredited skilled technicians and designers whose talents span the various branches of the art department in film and television. Today we will be talking about our time working on the Harry Potter films, with me, Gary Tompkins, an art director, and Nick Pelham, a storyboard artist. The webinar will be host hosted by Anne Clemens, herself a junior member of the art department. Hello, thanks for that introduction, Gary. I will be asking you guys some questions on behalf of some other junior members and we will see how interesting that will be. So my first question will be for Gary. Mm -hmm. So Gary, what, maybe you can explain a little bit in general, what was your role on the Potters? Like what sets did you work on? So I was lucky enough to work on all eight of the Harry Potter films and I was one of a number of art directors who worked on those films under the um, watchful eye of Stuart Craig, our production designer, the brilliant Stuart Craig, I have to add. And when I started on the first, first week of Harry Potter 1, I drew up the Gryffindor Boys Dormitory, um, which you can still see today at the Warner Brothers Studio Tour. So it's really nice going back there occasionally and, and seeing that first set that I drew up. Um, once I completed that, I did a lot of work over the period of all of the movies, working on Hogwarts Castle, the big miniature that was built as a shooting miniature, and some of the um, full-size sets related to that, including um, you know, ver various interiors and exteriors. Some of the other sets that I worked on were Shell Cottage, um, the Weasley House miniature, um, Weasley House interior, and you know many many other sets that I, I, I too too numerous to mention really. But it, it it was nice having over the over the period of the ten years that I worked on it to have a combination of working on the miniature sets and the full size sets. Well, that sounds like a nice variation. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, shall we ask Nick a question just to include him <laughs> into the conversation? So, Nick, how did you end up on the Potter films in general? How did you end up there? It's a big deal. Oh, the, the question. Um, <laughs> well, I had worked my, up, my way up through advertising. I had spent about five years in commercials. And at the time, I think this was 2000, um, there are a number of films around. And I had actually, the honest, truthful story is I was working on a small film that will remain nameless and they wouldn't put me on a contract and it was very frustrating because it would have been my first proper film coming from advertising I was making that career step and I was at home because I had kind of fallen out with the producer and the production manager and I rang up Leavesden Studios and asked to be put through to Stuart Craig and in those days, mm -hmm. the receptionist at Leaveson actually would. And sure enough, Stuart picked up his phone. Mm -hmm. And of course, I went into complete meltdown and said, you know, hello, my name is Nick Pelham and I'm a storyboard artist. Do you need one? And he strangely, bizarrely said yes. <laughs> and um, it was absolutely the right moment. It's, it's luck. You get a lot of luck in this business. And... Um, so anyway, I arranged to go up and see him, show him my portfolio. I went up there, I think the following week or something like that. Anyway, I arrived in the art department. Of course, nobody knew who, who I was, a total stranger. And I waited and waited and eventually the art department coordinator said, oh yes, you, yes, sorry, Stuart's out on a recce today. Well, my heart sank. And then what happened? She said, well, why don't I, sh introduce you to the American storyboard artist, a gentleman called Dan Sweetman. And Dan very kindly um, looked at my portfolio and then he obviously saw something. Um, so he took it downstairs to show Chris Columbus, the director. And the long and the short of it was is that he came back upstairs and he said, look Nick, you know, 
you haven't done many films, but we'll give you a week's tryout. And uh, so I had a week, and at the end of the week, they I asked, "Am I still on?" And, they, and Chris went, "Oh yes, of course." You know, so obviously I'd done something right in that week. But um, so I, you know, it was a lot of luck and uh, having a strong portfolio. <laughs> you know, all that sort of stuff. So that's how I got on Harry Potter. So Stuart got you on, and um, well, Stuart wasn't there. I do I do remember when when Stuart came. So I was hired, I think I started the next day, as is in this industry. You know, it's like, great, we love you, get on, you know, start tomorrow. And anyway, I went and introduced myself because, you, you know, head of the department and, you know, I'd met the director, so it's time to go and meet the production designer because I was working in an office up in the arts department. And I knocked on his door and said, hello, and who I was. And it, it sort of completely like threw him because it's like, oh, okay, you're our new storyboard artist. So, um, you know, he was very gracious and, and, and great and, and all that, but uh, he'd completely forgotten about me. Gary, what was it like for you as an art director? What was it like working with Stuart? Like, what was the process of designing the set with Stuart? Oh, well, Stuart is, is probably almost undoubtedly one of the, the greatest production designers there is, um, not only in the UK, but worldwide. You've only got to look at his sort of back catalogue of movies. To, to see the quality and the breadth of the, the films that he's he's worked on. So working on Harry Potter, that was the first time I'd actually been lucky enough to work with him. And he would, something like Hogwarts Castle that I was working on, he did the most beautiful series of pencil sketches of how he thought it would be. And from those pencil sketches, it, there, there was so much information um, that you could almost just take it away and, and draw it up. And the lovely thing about Stuart is he'll do a, a beautiful a beautiful sketch but then he'll do a little kind of scale plan and you know give you all the sort of parameters to which you're you're going to work to so combined with that is um the process something that Stuart is always incredibly keen on and and myself and everyone that worked on those shows it's everything should be based in reality so no matter how fantastical the design um it's all based in reality so once i had the sketches from Stuart and the, the sizes and the, the sort of you know overall scheme there'd be a lot of research many many books I bought some lovely books published in 18 I think 1875 which were by Pugin the architect um, that had a lot of gothic architecture in so a lot of those um, the sort of measured drawings in those books were adapted to, to elements of Hogwarts we had some locations in Annock Castle, Gloucester Cathedral, Durham Cathedral. So lots of photographs of the, those locations of doors and windows. They were integrated into the designs and into the drawings. And every step of the way with Stuart, you would you'd take it to, to one stage, Stuart would look at it and tweak it and let's make it wider, higher. And I think almost without exception in all the years that I've worked with Stuart, never has he made a suggestion on a, on a drawing where it hasn't improved it you you take it to a, to a to a point at which you think okay that's that looks pretty good that's marvelous and then Stuart will come and say why don't we just do that and do that and you think oh yeah genius and that that's what kind of sets him apart and um you know i think every, every set that i worked on be it you know everything from shell cottage through to the hogwarts miniature it was the same sort of process combination of Stuart's brilliant design ideas concepts combine that with lots of reference lots of you know, just keep looking at books, looking at photographs, looking on the internet, going out, go to Oxford, photograph Oxford colleges, all of that information you can then feed into the, the final kind of working drawings that will, you know, ultimately end up in the carpenter shop and as a full size set. Sounds great. So I'm curious, what was your favourite set to work on, Gary? <laughs> well, Hogwarts Castle obviously has a sort of always have a have a place in my heart because that was something that I kept going back to over all the movies I kept going back to Hogwarts Castle and the big miniature that we built and it's probably one of the last big miniatures that has ever been built for a movie because more and more stuff is towards the end of Potter more stuff was moving to be CGI so to, to have the the luxury of building this huge miniature which again is on display at the the Warners tour at Leavesden um, to actually be involved with that for all those all those years was fantastic and of course it, it changed on every film because you know there were things in the scripts towards the end that weren't even written in the books when we started on Harry Potter 1 so the design of Hogwarts kind of 
it was an evolution over the films and different things were added. And if anyone queried it, we say, well, it's magic. Of course it changes. So that kept us busy over the, all those movies was, you know, changing Hogwarts. So Hogwarts is, has always got to be one of my favorites. But I think in addition to that, I really like working on Shell Cottage. Um, and that we built as a, as a full size set. And we, we built it on location um, down in West Wales. And I think I agree with Stuart. Something Stuart once said was someone asked him if, if he prefers building a, a set or shooting on location. And he replied, well, I like building on location. <laughs> so you get the best of all worlds. So you get the environment, you get all the natural light, you get you know, all of that stuff na that nature gives you. Plus you have your own bit of set. So with Shell Cottage, we built it in Pembrokeshire on the beach. So we had the sea, we had the sand dunes, we built this cottage. It was prefabbed in the studios at Leveson. Um, we made lots of fiberglass shells for the roof tiles and for the walls. Built it in its entirety, flat packed it, put it on a series of trucks, drove it down to Pembrokeshire, built it on the beach, and then we dressed it in with the sand and it looked absolutely beautiful. I think the locals, the little, you know, the, the, the folk walking their dogs along the beach were completely gobsmacked, where in, you know, literally a series of days and a couple of weeks, this fantastic, cottage rose out of nowhere so that that was really fun so i think you know the, the miniature and shell cottage both completely different things but both equally rewarding definitely it sounds sadly good. you didn't see very much of shell cottage in the film <laughs> we went to a lot of effort we dressed the interiors we did gardens we had an allotment out the back absolutely a huge amount of effort and then when you see it on a movie of course everybody is you know um mourning the uh the action that happens there, no spoilers, but something <laughs> happens out at sea and in the background there is Shell Cottage. So uh, as is so often the case when you build sets on movies, you f see the, the final product and you think, all that effort, whatever happened? But you know, I know it was there. <laughs> so that was your favorite um, set. So Nick, what, what, what was your favorite movie to work on or your, your favorite, favorite sequence maybe, your favorite scene? Um. Uh, favorite movie to work on, I think, was number two, um, because we it was the same team as number one, so we just rolled almost. I think the movie opened on the Friday, the world premiere, and and Chris was back in the office on the Monday, prepping number two. But we'd already started prepping number two already, but he was then officially on number two, so we just rolled on. It was the same team, so there was that comfort. Uh, the pressure was off a little bit because number one had opened very well. So number two was a delightful, almost a year. Um, and uh, and favourite film, although I, I, I do like number three a lot. I like, um, but uh, favourite sequence, oh, I would probably say, certainly a career highlight is when um, Chris um, Columbus came up to my office, which is very rare. Usually we go to the director's office, uh, but I guess he was on his way to see Stuart because I was up in the art department, as I previously said, and he poked his head around the door and he said, um, Nick, uh, sort out Quidditch. And what he <laughs> meant by that is give, have a storyboard Quidditch, but give it a little bit more energy. Um, Quidditch in number one, mm, as good as it is, there was room for improvement. Um, and I certainly had some very strong ideas and um, bits and pieces I wanted to include in a Quidditch match. And that was just great. You know, th there I was, it was, it was the big scene, the big expensive scene. It's the scene that all the kids love, you know. Um, and so I spent the next three months doing that sequence and it changed and changed and changed. And Chris would come into m my office or I would go down to his and I would draw them one per page. And that meant that he could rip stuff out very quickly. Uh, cuts out on the cutting and pasting with scissors and glue. That takes a lot of time, believe it or not. And um, so that went on for three months and eventually it gets handed over to previous and then visual effects and they, they shoot it all day. But I love that and that we came up with some ideas and, th and there are certainly bits and pieces in that sequence which I came up with uh, and uh, contributed to. Um, that was one of my favorite scenes. I also like the night bus scene in number three, because it's just so wacky. 
and um, full of ideas. Um, and then, oh, okay, number one, uh, I did the Voldemort on the back of Quirrell's head. And that was good because it was just pressure, pure pressure. That introduced me to the world of storyboard pressure where you, you storyboard the storyboard and then eventually you find that you're actually going to shoot it in five days, four days, three days, two days, one day, and then you're actually shooting it tomorrow. And we were still storyboarding right up to the night before. So that was a big lesson for somebody who come from advertising and there's pressure in advertising, but it's a different kind of pressure. So, so I like doing that. So but I think they're the three sequences uh, that I really, really kind of liked drawing. And then there was other bits and pieces. I did the dueling contest in Harry too, because I don't like snakes and I thought it'd be good to draw snakes. Like <laughs> cure my phobia. Which I kind of did a little bit, but so you know. And there's loads of other bits and pieces that I did that were quite fun, but they're the main ones. Nice. Um you previously you mentioned that your relationship is mainly with the director, not mm -hmm. mainly with the designer. Maybe you can explain a little bit the relationship of your story sure. artist with the director. Sure. Um uh, storyboard, so we're usually um, hired by the director or certainly the production office producers. Very rarely these days hired by the production designer or the art department. Um, it's not often that we sit in, have our office in the art department anymore. We, we're normally closer to the director's office. Um, occasionally we're hired by visual effects. In the Harry Potter days, um, yes, it was it was certainly myself and my colleagues. There were a number of other storyboard artists on those shows. It wasn't just me. Um, and we would, you know, get our sequences from the director and draw them up. But the first thing you do when you get a sequence, when, when the director, wh whoever it was, Chris, Alfonso or Mike, um, the very first thing after you get your sequence and you've got your notes is you go and see Stuart. And you ask, what's, is there a set? Has he designed a set? Is there a concept? Is there a beautiful visual from one of the, the talent concept artists? And sometimes there if is. you're really lucky, there's a lovely cardboard model. <laughs> Occasionally. Yeah. Well, that happened on the later ones because the sets were actually built and the models were built. Mm. So by the time we got to three and four and five, you could actually go and stand in the set, mm. which was so helpful because you could take photos. Um, and we would check and sometimes there'd be something and sometimes there wouldn't. And I do remember on a number of occasions, Stuart saying, leave the background blank because I haven't designed the set. And it's not my job to design <laughs> the set. If it's a very basic room with a door and a window, you can draw a room with a door and a window. But if it's a um, dragon arena that si seats a thousand children, don't draw it until he's designed it. I do, I do remember. And um, so, so there's that. So then I, I draw up the sequence, uh, if there's any plans or sketches, and then show it to the director and it goes from there. So that, that's kind of the sort of, it's always storyboard artists work for the director, but we always, always consult with the designer. So we don't um, get into trouble, basically. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, next question for Gary, actually. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned that you've, worked on the miniatures. Mm -hmm. So how did that compare to building the full size sets? Um, very, very similar, to be honest with you. I mean, in terms of the drawing effort involved, it's exactly the same, whether you're drawing for a full size set or a miniature, um, identical process. Um, one little sort of interesting thing is if you're drawing up for a miniature, all the dimensions that you put on the drawing for a miniature you'll put as real dimensions so the reason being if then the scale changes you don't then have to redimension the whole thing so if, you, if you're drawing up a miniature of a house and that house is 30 foot tall then you dimension it as 30 feet you don't dimension it as you know 30 inches if it was one to ten uh, one to twelve so what you tended to do over the years was draw up um miniatures to different scales maybe 1 24th scale for hogwarts castle in the hole 1 to 10th scale was some of the larger scale elements that were used on um hogwarts because the closer the camera goes the larger the miniature has to be 
Um, all of those things we would we would continue doing in the art department exactly as it as if it would be a full size set. We would draw up full size details of doors, windows, everything, every final detail, every rivet on every hinge on every door for every building. The process of actually building the miniatures again very similar to a set. It would be largely timber. It would be fiberglass. It would be um, uh, plaster. So plaster stone sheet for the for the walls stuck onto a onto a plywood backing framed up at the back exactly as you would with a full size set. The one advantage we had with Hogwarts Castle, for example, was a little thing that a lot of people don't know is a lot of the towers were built out of cardboard tubes, very much like a you know when you're in school or on you know a blue peter or something like that you would make toilet rolls into towers to make um cardboard um towers and things for a castle we did exactly the same thing with hogwarts miniature you there is a company that will actually sell you a, any diameter of cardboard tube any length and any wall thickness so it was much more economical for some of those big circular towers to have big cardboard tubes which we would then put the plaster or fiberglass stonework on and you know rather than build an entire kind of plywood with framework inside we just use cardboard tubes so that's probably the only difference from a full-size set but otherwise the process of both drawing and building is exactly the same with miniatures and full sizes you have to be very careful with with the painting and you have to it sounds daft but you almost have to scale down the paint work when you're doing a miniature um you know there's, there's subtleties and, and miniatures painters are very um sought after kind of folk really because you know there's, there's a, a sort of sensitivity that you have to put in for painting miniatures um not to say you don't with a full size set but it's slightly different so yeah it, it was it was it was interesting it was interesting that sounds it sounds interesting definitely so i know nick has mentioned some things before about the art department and the storyboard artists working together but maybe Gary, do you have anything like, did you have to work personally with the storyboard artist? Do you have? Yeah. I mean, you know, as Nick says, largely a board artist will work with a director. But having said that, um, you know, once once the, the storyboard artist comes up into the, the art department and looks, you will, if, if it's a set that you're working on, um, you will talk through that set with the, the storyboard artist. If, if it's been designed by Stuart he, and then drawn up by, by one of us art directors, we can then talk through and, and you know, convey Stuart's ideas that we know he's got in mind for that set. Um, and, you know, invariably there'll be a nice cardboard model that's been made. We will then, you know, talk, talk the artist through that. Um, we'll float walls out. We can photograph inside it, get the best angles. I mean, it's usually up to the, the storyboard artists. They usually come up with the very best angles. <laughs> but, um, you know, we will, we will help with that. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a, a technique that I think, Nick, you might correct me with this, but I think many years ago, the storyboard artists used to be more integral to the art department than now. Mm. They always used to be yeah. set in the art department. Um, yeah, it's in sort of latter, latter years where they, sometimes they don't even stay in the art department. They're more in the, you know, director's suite. Miles office. away, miles away. <laughs> Which is sad because it's, you know, their, their work is, is as artistic as anything in the art department. Yeah. And although they take their lead from the director. Uh, I think the last time I worked with Nick, we, he was in the art department with us and that was a really good relationship because he would, you know, wander out of his office and there are all the models and, mm. you know, our designer of the time was there, Neil, and, you know, he could chat with Neil and, you know, what were Neil's ideas. And I, I for one, think, you know, although the board artist sort of falls between the director and the art department, I think, you know, I would always love to have them in the art department because, you know, it's a, uh, it's such a sort of creative environment compared to a lot of director's offices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, that job you mentioned, Gary, was one of the first time for years I'd worked in an art department. Mm. And I do, I do remember being given that office because it had lovely light. Yes. And so I jumped on it straight away. But You uh, did, I remember I, that. Yeah. And, <laughs> and also, I think, I think um, on that production, production office or the director's office were all filled up but but yeah it was nice to be in the art department and i've worked on other films recently where i've been so far away literally the other side of the studio and it's a bit of a walk and um you know emails are great of course and and it's all on the 
server, but it's so much nicer to go into the art department. Um, my, on my current job, the art department's right upstairs, so it, it's nice to go up and have a chat and raid the fridge. So <laughs> you know, it's, it's all about food. Um, but yeah, it is. It's important, and you build up a lovely uh, rapport with the art directors because yes, they they see those sets all the way through to the end, and you can ask questions, and they're so helpful. You know, they're tremendous, and uh, and then you you come away up from the project with a whole load of cool drawings and plans. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's very important to, to go into the art department. Mm. Very nice. So I'm obviously a junior position, so I'm not very experienced, especially not when it comes to storyboard artists. So I'm just curious, how does the situation work, Nick, with like time frame and materials for you to do your job? Like how how are you working? What what are you working with? Okay. Um well it, to start with we'll, we'll go right from the sort of the initial meeting so i will sit down uh with the director and there, there are two main schools of how film directors uh have their storyboard artists work what one is uh they will give you a sequence they might say well i want a bit of this this and this and then you go away and you you drop the whole sequence but making sure that those little moments are in there and and that's very cool because you know you can think well how should it be directed how would the director like it you can come up with ideas and you know it's, it's a very nice way to work then the other way um which i uh, was was quite uh, how alfonso Curran worked is you would sit down for hours and hours and hours and he would describe every single shot now some directors do that and because it's they have it all in their head already and your job is just to draw it better than they can some directors can draw very well. They're, they're out there. We, we, all, we all know who those directors are. But most directors can't. Um, so hence why we're hired to draw their film as clearly as possible for everybody else to understand. So once I've got those notes, um, be it even method, I will then go away and possibly do some thumbnails. Now, I always use, for the first pass, anything from Ryman's or, or you know, and that's kind of dropping a name but any, any pen layout pad a couple of days just get the shots down get some thumbnails going get them back in front if the director wants to see them cool they usually do make sure you're going in the right direction so that that's a pad of paper and some pens once they're happy with those thumbnails then i will go away now in the past i've used uh 4b pencils then um, I, I kind of use a sharper 2B now. Sometimes I'll do it in fine liner. Um, and these days, just to make them look a little bit nicer and posher, um, I will add a bit of gray tone in Photoshop. But there is still essentially original pages of artwork. That's just my personal way of working. Some of my colleagues are totally digital. They will draw their work on the uh, Wacom tablets or Cintiq or something. Um, it's just a personal preference. I just still like pencil and paper, and I think I always will. But the gray tone does make it look a little bit more slick, especially these days, because um, most of the storyboards, and this is a fascinating thing now with the industry, are shown digitally be it on iPads, on great big high definition monitors, and even editorial or meetings, very rarely do we get them printed out on A4 bits of paper and issues. It's, I think it's a security thing, and it's also a, a lot of waste of paper, you know, seriously. Um, so they look better digitally if they've got a bit of gray tone. So that's, that's just my ego kicking in there. So make my work look nicer. Um, so that's it, and then, and then you, you do print them out and uh, occasionally a few people will have sets of the direct. I always give, give printed copies to the director. They, they usually have a folder. Some look at them, some just file it away. It's, it's their personal choice. Um, on Harry Potter set of films, it was always a 4B pencil with quite a blunt edge. So it was quite a thick line because, um, and this is gonna age me, we were drawing, and I'm sure my colleagues who were on that, those films as well, we were always drawing for the photocopier. 
um, there's no point doing a beautiful storyboard panel and then the it gets photocopied and the tone has run out and you can't see anything. So you always pressed harder. And a 4B gave you that thick black line that when, the, when they were copied, you could see, you could at least see the drawings. It was heartbreaking when you got them back and you couldn't see anything that you'd drawn. You know? So we were always overdrawing. So that, and that's now, nowadays the scanners are so good, you, you can draw a very light pencil, it'll still show up. So, uh, you know, we're talking 20 years <laughs> technology. But, um, but yeah, I, and I miss those days. I miss that, those 4B pencils sometimes, but deadlines are shorter and I've adapted my style to be quicker because they always want them by tomorrow. <laughs> so that's many, but still pencil and paper for me. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, just, I'm curious. I've obviously, I've read all the Harry Potter books when I was a child. And I am not that experienced. So as a, as a storyboard artist, when you get the script and you read it, are you like, obviously there's a lot of information in there, but there's obviously more information in the Harry Potter books. Are you allowed for your sketches to use the books for more information? Like what, what things look like, or, or are, you, are you just bound to the script exclusively? Script, it's, it, I'm sh I certainly read books one to four something to do if nothing else I, th I think Chris was away on a shooting and location and I think I read them then um no it's it's always the script because it's the script that is being made into the film um of course the the books have far more detail uh far more information but it's very dangerous to draw something from the book because it it, it might have been cut out or or the or the director wants it in a different way, or, or Stuart has a different view of how it, it could look in real you know, film world rather than book world. Um, it's, it is a question I always get asked, and it's always script, script, script. We, I personally can't speak for my colleagues, but I personally never looked at the book or read the book to get an idea of anything. It was always the, working from the script. Yeah. yeah. Well. Fair enough, it's on the safe side. Yeah, yeah, very, very safe. Very, very it, it could be very dangerous to take something from the book because you, you could hand in a set of storyboards and they'll say, well, this isn't in the script. Where did you get this? And, well, from the book. Well, we're not making the book, we're making the script. This is the, yeah. you know, a script, the script writer and the director and the studio have, have condensed the book into a workable script, which will be a two hour movie. Whereas the book is, is probably, would make probably, I don't know, eight hour movie or something you know so so it is there it is there for a reason and a very particular reason so you know and i think it's probably the same for i think it's probably the same the same with you know stuart when he's designing essentially mm. it is for the script however i know stuart did read the books and obviously he had the ear of, of joe rowling as well so mm. um there were certain things where you know, the, the level of detail in all of the sets for all of the Harry Potter films was so huge. There were lots of things that were included that may well have been in the books, but not necessarily written in the scripts. So, you know, J Joe's descriptions of, of places and interiors and exteriors, all of that stuff is, is so strong that I know there were, you know, elements that were included, background stuff that, you know, if, if you knew it was there in the books, you, you'd be very happy to see it there in the, you know, in the films. Mm. And I think that was also true going through to the, you know, the graphics department, Mira and Eduardo, when they were doing some graphic props and stuff, you know, they were always looking at the, at the books to get additional information just to kind of pad out the, um, you know, the, the written word in the script. So I think, you know, also with the Potters, almost uniquely, the, the readers of the books are so familiar with everything in the books that when they see the films, they are, you know, your harshest critic because why, haven't you done this? why didn't you do that? Why, why is that there? Cause he should have said, so of me. You know, in, a way, it, in fact, it's yeah. you I'm talking about Anne. Yes. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it, 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 it was very important that if, if there was something key that was written in the book, but hadn't made it to the script, then we would try and include that within the, within yeah. the, the sets. Yeah. My, my, my friend was, my friend was incensed, all those years ago, I always remember this, incensed that the Whomping Willow kept moving around. <laughs> it was the courtyard. Of course it was. <laughs> he was furious. And he was, he was an adult. You, you wouldn't expect, <laughs> you, you know, 
uh, it was brilliant. They, they kept moving. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant days. So, Gary, question for you. Mm -hmm. What was the most challenging thing on one of your sets that you've worked on where you thought, oh, why? Um, that's a tricky one. I mean, they all, yeah. I, Sorry. I think we all, work, we all work together so for so long as such a great team. I think, you know, any of those sort of challenges, you know, amongst the, you know, the huge number of people within the art department and Stuart at the helm and Neil as supervisor, you know, we were able to kind of meet those challenges head on and nothing really was a major headache. The one thing that does come to mind though is we, we did a big set um, in the battlements. It was, you know, in, in the last film and the, the Harry and Voldemort, a big kind of fight. And it was all gonna be up in the roof space of the battlements in one of the, the buildings of Hogwarts. And it went through several sort of different iterations and how we're gonna do it. And we wanted a feeling of jeopardy and, uh, and then Harry had to fall over. So the, the geography of the whole thing and how that then would uh, would mean we, we would have to change the miniature to match the full size set that we were designing. And I remember I was talking to Stuart and we came up between between us with this idea that in order to get more jeopardy, as um, Harry and Voldemort were fighting within this roof space, instead of just having a flat floor, if we were to have a series of kind of hanging walkways, so there were chains that came down from the rafters, and all of these walkways they would as they as they they fought they would they, they would be swinging and then below the um those walkways you you could see this sort of void going down right down through the you know the body of the building so you know a hundred foot drop and then you know the walkway would get broken and it would crash down and someone would hang so that was a great idea and we made a huge model of that big cardboard model and everyone loved it i think we all loved it until the day of shooting when of course the grips and the dop and the camera crew came and of course wherever they put their camera it was constantly sort of swinging and moving <laughs> but again everyone got over it and i think it ended up as a really good sequence in the film but, you know that that was one of those sets you know we read we, we read the sequence and you know stuart came up with these fantastic sort of set ideas and we developed that over a series of different sort of versions to eventually come up with something that was really cool, even if it did have a few sort of challenges to actually shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Um, cool. Well, yeah, that was that was a cool set, and I can imagine that being very challenging. Um, I've got some general questions for both of you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe Nick. Um, maybe I'll start with you. Did mm -hmm. you always see yourself in the job that you are in right now because you said you started in advertising? So yes, yes, I, I, uh, it goes all the way back to when I was what, uh, roughly about 10 years old, yeah. and I, although I always wanted to work in the film industry, even as a child, you know, much younger than that, I think I went through the phase of special effects man and stunt man. And um, yeah, until my brother put me right on that. Um, <laughs> but but storyboarding, yes, and it, and I I do strongly believe it was all years and years ago on Saturday mornings they used to show like the making of movies, be it Raiders of the Lost Ark or whatever film was out that week. And it and I remember there's a clip in the making of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I'm sure it's on YouTube, where Steven Spielberg is showing Harrison Ford and the actors his storyboards. And it's the scene where they go into the chamber of all the snakes and all that. And I thought, what a cool job. And I was 10, so I didn't know about storyboarding, but I thought that's a cool thing. Somebody had to draw them. So I used to storyboard all my little Star Wars figure games. And <laughs> boy, I wish I kept them. But anyway, then I did storyboarding at work experience at secondary school. I went to a local video company and I, I did stuff there. And then, of course, you go through your sort of teens, late teens and early 20s, where you think you'll never get into the industry, you know, because it, it, it's hard. Sure. And, um, and eventually, uh, I, I did, um, to cut a long story short, I did a, an exhibition for a local military museum uh, where I, dare I say, I was sort of an art director of position, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it was all about 50 years of D-Day and the Battle of Arnhem and we built everything and I did the backings and all that. And that's the portfolio I showed, believe it or not, it's absolutely true, Stuart Craig. <laughs> long before Harry Potter, this is long before, so this is 95. 
so I and and I'd done storyboards in my spare time. I I had adapted my favourite novel. Uh, I think uh, I think it was War of the Worlds. Uh, it's something that hasn't been made properly, so you know, it's a, there was I wasn't treading on anybody's toes. And Stuart saw that and everything, and he and he saw that I wanted to be a storyboard artist, and he introduced me to a storyboard artist, and that and that gentleman very kindly gave me a few little jobs. So I got in that way. But yes, I always wanted to do about from about ten. It was always there. Even when I never thought I'd get into the industry, there was still thinking, you know, when I was at art school for a year, I needed a year at art school, I was storyboarding the film students' work. And those I have still got. So <laughs> they're quite sweet to look back on. Um, so yeah, it was it was always something. You know, and of course there's the legendary art of Star Wars, Jedi, Empire books with Joe Johnson's work. Um, a lot of concept artists, rightly so, you know, are inspired by Ralph McCoy. For me, it was Joe Johnson and Ivor Beddoes. So uh, they were the guys that sort of, you know, I was inspired by drawing my little storyboards <laughs> in my bedroom all those years ago. And it's a shame I don't have any network. <laughs> yes, yes, it was, it was a job I always wanted to do. Well, what about you, Gary? Is that... Always. Yes, I think, you know, much the same. Always kind of wanted to do that. As a kid, I was always, you know, making model railways, little cardboard buildings, <laughs> model railways and, you know, plastic kits and drawing. You know, used to love drawing at school and at, at home. Always, you know, had a pencil in my hand. And, you know, that kind of progression from building little cardboard models for your model railway. Uh, suddenly, you know, when I when I got my first job, the first thing I did was build a little cardboard model of a castle. Oh, on a film quite <laughs> Well, it was a film called Crow back in 1982, something like that. And, you know, the irony is that that was my first job building this, you know, lovely little cardboard model of a castle. And then many, many, many years later, one of the first things I did when I was on Harry Potter was help make a cardboard model of a castle. So, <laughs> which, which to this day, you know, is, uh, you know, Hogwarts Castle, one of my, you know, favourite, favourite things to have worked on. So there's a kind of thread running through there. Hmm. <laughs> it does come round, yeah. It does. <laughs> yeah. It really does. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, Nick, you've just mentioned that you got inspired. So that leads me to my next question. Mm -hmm. Is there a person who is or was an inspiration for you guys for you to work in this industry? So like like you just mentioned, well, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, for, for me, it was, I do remember buying The Art of Empire Strikes Back when I, when I was about 10 or 11. It was a fabulous, fabulous, it's long gone now, bookshop uh, on Tottenham Court Road or just off it called the Cinema Bookstore. Beautiful. It's like one of the traditional old London, tiny, tiny little bookshops. And they had it. And my dad took me up there and bought it with all my pocket money and all that, you know, usual story. And there were a few storyboard up in that. You, you could tell. And there, there, were, there was um, of Ivor Beddoes stuff. He was the UK storyboard artist. And there was a, a, quite a few of Joe Johnson's and so that one book and then a few years later I picked up in a in a, a school fate the storyboards of Raid of the Lost Ark oh, yeah. and uh, which is a fabulous book so so you know I'm now 13 14 now and I just poured over that book just couldn't get enough of it I was copying it and you know so and I think the artist was David Negron and Ed Barrow to give them credit um so so those guys inspired me you know, and and then of course you you get to know more and more, and, and you know you watch film credits and you think, hold on, there's something going on here. So so there, but it's certainly Joe Johnson and Iva Beddoes from that one book that were my were my sort of first inspiration. You know, and That's I'm still that. inspired by I have so <clears> many <throat> artists now. I will not you with a list, but to this very day, there's artists out there who still are brilliant, and I think. Oh, Thank God. God. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's important. It's always important to keep an eye and, and be inspired by other artists and comic book artists and storyboard artists and concept artists and you know, so many talent talented people out there. You you've gotta you know keep looking and appreciating their their work. It makes you draw better yourself. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. but they're, they're the main. Nice. What yeah, about you, Gary? Well it's it's funny Nick mentions those books. I mean they're actually on the on the shelf over there somewhere. The Art of Star Wars, <laughs> Art of Empire Strikes Back with James Johnson, Ralph McQuarrie. Those, you know, I remember looking through as Nick did, you know, the most wonderful sort of sketches, all pre 
digital, of course. They're all, you know, fine point markers and, and Pantone, mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful artwork. And, you know, the, the funny thing is having, having looked at those and poured over those, you know, dozens of years ago, it was quite nice when I then worked on Star Wars and we were looking at those as a reference source for, you know, the new generation of Star Wars that we've made. So, you know, again, it sort of comes full circle. And, mm. you know, I, I ended up, I, I've, I worked with Joe Johnson when he was still a sort of concept storyboard artist on Willow, which was a, a, a movie that was made over on Howard film quite a few years ago. So, you know, that, I'd been in the industry probably about 10 years by then, but, you know, at the time it was a great thrill to actually meet someone whose, whose work I had admired, you know, in a book all those years prior. Yeah. And then, you know, several years beyond that, then we're working on a Star Wars film and, you know, we're looking at that as a reference source and then try and, you know, come up with, you know, similar sort of designs and ideas for, for the most recent Star Wars. So things just keep coming around, you know, I think that's, mm. that's something... Yeah. Good design and you know good art. It, it's not something that goes out of date. No. The, the, the only occasion I've ever <clears throat> there, there was a storyboard artist. Well, he's still very much uh, working in in Los Angeles. He's an American a guy called David Lowry, and he was uh, or probably still is Steven Spielberg's storyboard artist. And he has a beautiful style. And I do remember he rang up the Potter Art Department because his friend was working over here. And I picked up the phone and, and everything, and I eventually just, you know, I figured out who I was talking to. And I actually did say, so I had that one occasion where I went, oh, you inspired me when I was trying to get into the business, and I totally copied your style. <laughs> and, um, and he was so gracious. He said, well, of course you did, because that's what you do when you start out. You, you mm. look at the people you admire, Absolutely. you copy them, because you don't know how to do it yourself, and then you evolve and adapt your style to be you. Absolutely. And, and I thought... You know, he's absolutely right. You know, of course he is. But it was so nice to actually just talk to one of my storyboarding heroes. Mm. And years and years and years and years and years later, on my current job, his son is our storyboard coordinator <laughs> in Los Angeles. So it's kind of like, wow, there you go. So, um, you know, it's, it's great. But there's, there's loads of people that, you know, keep you inspired. That's, yeah, that's important. Mm. So, um, Gary, we had some... Uh, name dropping like star wars and i know you've worked on some so what other films have you worked on oh well <laughs> uh, where do i start yes um obviously the posters i'll, I'll go and get a cup of tea <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the posters were a great um you know segment of my my sort of career but um since the potters uh, i think from them i went on to warhorse the steven spielberg warhorse uh, the Tom Cruise film, Edge of Tomorrow. Um, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, uh, Rogue One and Solo. Um, and then prior to that, before I did Potter, I worked on things as diverse as uh, The Fifth Element, the Luc Besson film. Mm -hmm. um, 1492, um, that's a Ridley Scott film. Um, so yeah, quite, quite a, you know, a... a, a a diverse collection really okay. everything from period dramas through to sci-fi which i think you know is quite quite nice if you've if, if you've got a career that can span several different genres very adventurous everything nice what about you nick do you want to name oh. drop some films for us oh um oh well my, my first big studio <laughs> thing where i worked at pinewood for i think eight or nine months was a tv show called the tenth kingdom so that was my, that was very important job in my career because I was the only storyboard artist and uh, it was a big long job and I was, I, I was at the famous Pinewood studio. So that's, that's cool. And then more recently, um, I, I did the car chase sequence in Spectre in, in Rome. That was, that was a lot of fun because I got to go to Rome. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just for a recce. Um, and then uh, I, I, Doctor Strange, which was, which was cool. Um, uh, Spider-Man Far From Home, which was incredibly hard work. Um, boy, did they keep me on my toes. Um, and, and more recently, I, I have a, a, a lovely sort of collaboration with a director, um, and I've done his last four films. So uh, we've done Into the Woods, Mary Poppins, did Pirates of the Caribbean, that was, that was cool, Drawing Pirates. 
can't go wrong with drawing pirates. Mm. Um, and and so yeah, so so yeah. That's, and, oh, and I work with Gary on solo. <laughs> so I have dipped my toe in the Star Wars universe, just I think what, just the once. So. Well, that, yeah, nice. And I got to draw Star Destroyers, which was very cool. <laughs> you know, like Gary was saying, I finally got to draw. You know, you get to draw the things you drew as a kid. And you get paid. <laughs> yes, yeah. But the funny thing is, is that um. You know, you finally get to draw stormtroopers shooting at each other and all that. You know, I'm sure the viewers will know that movie, um, and and um, all the battles and the star destroyers and all that. But you have to do it so quick. They're not there. I'm not there to draw pretty drawings of exactly what the guns look like. And the star destroyers, star destroyers, we all famously, you know, know is just a, a triangle. So if you just draw a little triangle in the sky. That says it all. Um, so it's kind of fun. You finally do a Star Wars movie, and all you know. My boards are, were quick because it had to be had to be done by the end of the day always. So because uh, everyone has to see them, that's my that's my and um, my colleagues' jobs is to get the drawings as quick as clear as possible. So, but it was it was a lot of fun, you know. And of course, you know, there's all the famous Star Wars stuff <laughs> that you can't help but have a look at. <laughs> so yeah, that was good. So yeah, that, that was pretty busy, busy, you know. Yeah, yeah, I kept that mischief. <laughs> <laughs> Another general question, um, maybe Nick, just maybe you go first. What is there anything you wish someone would have told you before you entered this industry? Like, good piece. Oh. Um, <laughs> you, you always do learn from, from every job. You never stop learning. Um, I won't tell you any of my real big blunders. Um, but. I, t I tell you the one thing I wish I had, had been more careful of. When I moved, when I had come from advertising and I finally got the break into movies and it happened to be Harry Potter, you know, it's tremendously lucky and fortunate. One of my first, you know, first big, big, you know, serious movie was the Harry Potter movie. Then over those next four or five years, uh, my career went very much into movies. Which is which is great, but I wish I wish I had been careful and kept a few of my advertising clients, because you know when there's no movies or or something, you know adverts they're great, you know you you know you work two or three days and and everything, and it's it's nice to, so I, I wish I had, um, but it was just a natural drifting away. It's, yeah. it's nobody's fault. It it just happens in 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 your career path, but I wish I'd been a bit more careful, just keeping in touch with some of those companies. Um, you know, a lot of those people now have retired or moved on or whatever. So it's I'm very detached from that world now. But um, yeah, you know, it, yeah. Th that if I could do it all again, it w it would just be I would be a bit more careful in that area. But yeah. otherwise, no, everything everything's fine. You know, you you have ups, you have downs. You know, Definitely. you learn from your mistakes. We all we've all made them, and you. Ooh, but, help you yeah. evolve it makes you a better artist in the long run so, yeah. and boy i've made some doozies <laughs> i'm not going to tell you that <laughs> no. uh, well gary anything you wish you had known like someone would have told you before no not really i mean i think you know like anyone starting in the industry you kind of have to find your own feet and you know no two jobs are the same that's the thing um you know, you can work on one film with one bunch of people and, work on, and and things are slightly different and different subject matter and different. So I think, you know, it, it's quite hard. I think anyone coming into the industry, you, you, you have to just, you know, have a you know, very sort of open mind. You must get on with people and you know, just see how, how the lie of the land lays. And, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's knowing that, you know, things aren't so, well, I won't say right now because we're in the middle of COVID, but, you know, up in the last few years, things have been, you know, incredibly busy in the film industry and newcomers coming into the film, they've been lucky enough to go from one film to another. You know, when I started, you would work for a few months and then maybe have a couple of months off and then, so, you know, the film industry always has and always will be a sort of freelance industry. So I think, you know, the one bit of advice I would give to people coming in is to remember that you know, it's not always necessarily the good times. You know, there, are, there can be times when you will be wondering why the hell did I get into this stupid business. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but hopefully not not so often. But um, you know, on the whole, it's it's all pretty good. Yeah. Well, yeah. you just snatched away my last question, Gary. I was actually going to ask about the 
one number one piece of advice you would give to us? <laughs> well, you know, nothing else. But, um, I mean, yeah. I think I think the advice you know I see so many people you know coming through with their portfolios. The, the the terrific thing now compared to when I started in the business all those years ago was there are so many film and TV design courses. Um, you know, there are postgrad courses, there are there are you know um, all, all manner of, of courses you can do. Um, it's very important when you come in and you get your first job in the industry to have a portfolio of drawings. And that can be a combination of digital drawings, hand drawings, graphics, model making, have as big a portfolio as you possibly can of you know, couple models, different drawings, sketch it, doesn't matter. Just if you think, you know, you have an example of, of, of all sure. the, the breadth, breadth of different techniques that will help to get you a job. And the other thing I think I would say to people is, it doesn't matter how competent you are at the drawing, what you also need to know is, is what you're drawing, it's the content. So whenever you're out and about, just keep looking, keep your eyes open, mm. keep photographing. If you see a lovely shop front, photograph it, file it. If you're in a, in a churchyard or a church and there's a lovely lich gate, photograph it, file it away. You know, th there's an enormous wealth of, of beautiful architecture out there, which will come in handy one day. And it, either you've got it in your head or you can, you know, these days everyone's got a phone and you take a record of it. Because if an art director asks a, a draftsman, oh, can you draw me up a, a door or a window and I'd like it like this and I'd like it like that. If you've actually, it's one thing going on the internet, it's, oh yeah, there's a, there's a sash window or whatever it is, I can, I can draw that. If you've actually seen that on a building out and about and you've looked at it and you've analysed it and I think that's a, that's a huge, huge advantage to, you know, you, you never know what you're going to be asked to draw within the art department. So just always, whenever you're out and about, keep your eyes and ears open and just look and, and, and try and, you know, think how something has been put together, even if it's brickwork or, you know, interesting brickwork between piers of a door and a window. It's, it's all, that, all that sort of little stuff that will set apart the person that is really competent at drawing, but they, they, don't, they, they, they can't draw the subject matter and someone who is equally good at drawing, but actually knows what they're going to draw. Yeah. So that, that would be a, a bit of advice I'd give. That's a good piece of advice, actually, because everybody can do that. Just go around and look at things. And keep yes, cost no money. Yeah, Definitely. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, number one advice for people who want to start maybe into your direction. Um, I always look for people who, I look for the passion. I know that sounds corny, but no, I, cool. I really wanted to be a storyboard artist. So what I want to see in somebody, if one day and this will happen, someone will come into my office and, you know, really, really want my job, basically. And I want them to sort of know about storyboarding and a little bit of the history of storyboarding and be able to tell me who their favorite five storyboard artists are. You know, all that, all that nonsense. <laughs> um, Does it I, include you? Yes, it has to include me. Number one. Uh, and, 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 then, and then I will look, more on a, on a serious note, perspective and anatomy. Um, you know, if you, if you can draw that, then you're halfway there. Um, good, clear drawings. It's all about, a storyboard is all about conveying information. Um, you, you know, you, you, you've got the director and then all the heads of department and, and the producers and even the studio, studio executives, they all get the storyboards and they, they just want to see it clearly. So that, so if you can draw clearly and precisely, but quickly, um, you know, you're, you're a good chunk there. And then just keep, keep doing, keep practicing. And, and um, it's, it's rare that, a new storyboard artist will start straight in movies. It, it has happened in the past. Um, but, you know, I, I learned my trade in commercials and, that, and, you know, two or three jobs a week for five years, then little films, short films, student films. I did a lot of student films. They get a free storyboard and you get experience of drawing sequences. Um, and the other thing you've got to do, and I still do, is watch movies, all sorts of movies. I do remember one of my first ever jobs way 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 back it was a tv drama and the director taught me about lenses and you know the difference between a a wide lens and a long lens and he, he got out his camera his slr camera and he showed me and, and all that and it was great so that's the other trick is when somebody's teaching you something pay attention you know don't just brush it off thinking you know it all or it's out there on the internet it's it, there's nothing better than a director 
just taking that five minutes, they don't have to, they're busy people, um, giving you that piece of advice. Many commercial directors told me how to, you know, storyboard something that's only 30 seconds long. You know, you've got to sell that product in 30 mm. seconds, which is 25 frames, roughly. So, you know, make sure that you pay attention when someone's giving you advice and then work your way up the ladder. And then eventually the big jobs come. <laughs> if you, you know, it does happen. Yeah. So, uh, but it be prepared to take time. I say that to all the people who have asked me this. Just don't want it straight away because you won't be professionally ready. They're not there to babysit you. They're there to expect drawings to a certain quality, and if you can't cut it, you'll be out. And boy, does that hurt! You know, it happened to me once, way, way, way back. I wasn't professionally ready, and the other storyboard artist just took over and did my scenes. Oh. Uh, then I went, and, ah, it's true. So. You know, but I learnt my trade and then got back into the films and yeah, the rest is history. So. If you learn from the mistakes, that's... Um, you learn more from your mistakes, don't you? That's, I know it's a cliche, but it's, no, true. it's true. Yeah, it's you true. Know, it's absolutely true. You truly do. And you learn from people if you're prepared to listen to them. So many people, my position, are just afraid of making mistakes, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I want to do everything perfect, but I can't because I'm a junior position. So, I mean, I'm not happy to make a mistake, but no one will kill you if you do one. <laughs> People are just like, I have senior positions, like Gary's working with me at the moment. So you can always go and ask and no yeah. one will rib your head off. They no. will be like, oh, we're happy to explain. No. Because so. we've yeah, all been in that position. Is. That's the point. We have all been a junior. We've yeah. all been a draw, you know, so I think, you know, if, if there were a rare occasion where an art director didn't have the patience to teach a junior, then, you know, they need to remember where they started. So Absolutely. I'm, I'm always very, very happy to, to, you know, help out any of the sort of yeah. junior positions and, and yeah. give them advice. Yeah, no, it's important to, you've got to, you've got to give it back, haven't you? A little bit, just, you know, because people help me. Yeah, yeah. don't you know. be afraid. You, you might employ me one day, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, <laughs> well yeah that was um you guys have answered all my questions and Great. all the questions that i've collected mm -hmm. so thank you so much for giving me and everyone else in the audience an insight of storyboarding harry potter art directing and um thank you yeah, it was, this was a nice nice conversation <laughs> <laughs> you're very welcome so Thank you all. And if you'd like to see more members of the British Film Designers Guild talking about their work on film and TV shows, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel where there are lots of other videos sharing behind the scenes stories of a wide range of productions from Fleabag to Star Wars. And, yeah. um, you know, it's a fantastic collection of videos and webinars that the BFDG has put out um, over this coronavirus period. And, you know, I think it'll be very handy for anyone watching um, to get a great insight into what we actually do.